We've all heard about the devastation palm oil plantations have caused in critical wildlife habitats across Asia. But we don't often hear solutions to the problem. How do we conserve the wild jungles of Indonesia while also supporting the communities that call the islands home? Welcome to Rewildology, the nature podcast that delves into the human side of conservation, travel, and rewilding our planet. I am your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Jane Dunlop, an inspirational conservationist who is protecting endangered species and fragile ecosystems in Indonesia. Jane's journey began in 2008 when she relocated to the island of Sumatra with her husband, Luke. Called to protect this biodiverse paradise, she witnessed firsthand the threats of poaching, deforestation, and unsustainable palm oil practices. In response, Jane and her husband co-founded three, yes, three, impactful organizations, Ecosystem Impact, Alawan, and the Mahi Mahi Surf Resort. Ecosystem Impact focuses on conservation issues in Sumatra, working to protect sea turtles, songbirds, and their habitats. Alawan partners with local coconut farmers to promote sustainable farming and eco-business. And the Mahi Mahi Surf Resort generates funds to support ecosystem impact critical conservation initiatives. In our conversation, Jane shares the origin story of her organizations, her efforts to protect endangered sea turtles and other wildlife, restore songbird populations, and provide sustainable livelihoods to local communities. All of this while balancing the most important role in her life, being a mother. Jane also provides tangible ways we can support conservation in Sumatra and around the world. So get ready, fellow rewildologists, for a purposeful exploration through the jungles of Sumatra and Jane Dunlop's amazing story of passion and purpose. Well, hi, Jane. Thank you for sitting down with me on literally the complete opposite side of the world, which is so cool that we can even do this. And so first, let's introduce you to everyone listening. Just who are you? What's your name? What's, what, what do you do? Just who, who's Jane? <laughs> Thank you, Brooke. And it's so nice to be speaking again. Um, my name is Jane. And yeah, who is Jane? I guess. These days, um, my time is spent um, between being a mum and I guess actually in many ways I am mothering um, the birth and sort of early years of my children as well as two different organisations. So uh, I founded and am the CEO of an organisation called Alawan and another organisation called Ecosystem Impact, which I'm looking forward to exploring with you today. Yes. Oh, we're going to get into all the things, but let's let's maybe go back uh, a couple years to share context and how these two fantastic organizations came to be and how they're together, but they're not, which is going to be so fun to explore with you. So maybe first, can you pinpoint maybe the moment that this path launched was there like an experience that you had that you're like oh my gosh this is my calling this is my why was it a gradual thing or what was that like for you what started this I have always been very connected to our planet to nature um so I don't think there was any ever any one moment um I grew up in New Zealand I grew up on a farm and my favorite thing to do was always to just put on a pair of running shoes and I would run forever and always felt comfortable and at home in nature and on my own or on the farm with the animals. Um, I would ask my parents to drop me off in the middle of nowhere and run home. So I've always um, felt at home uh, in the wild and the mountains with my own or with others. I went to university and I uh, saw my 
friends at law school, signing up for summer clerkships and receiving bottles of champagne. And I just found myself looking over the other side and just having absolutely no interest in that. And it started me thinking, hmm, what am I going to do? Uh, and so I started exploring opportunities. Um, and my mother-in-law, my now mother-in-law actually, found this little clipping in the newspaper that um, talked about opportunities to go um, overseas and do um, conservation volunteer environment work. And um, I think within six months, I took a semester of university and I ended up in Borneo in Malaysia. Um, and so that was definitely a, when I look back, that was a, a milestone, certainly, on the path. Um, I spent my 21st birthday in the middle of the rainforest and I remember calling on the radio um, home. And I also distinctly remember after that visit, uh, sorry, after that trip, it was with other young people who were about 30 of us, I decided to travel on my own afterwards. And I took a bus trip through Sarawak in Malaysia. And for probably 10 hours, I saw these little um, green buds in this blackened landscape. And it was palm oil. And that completely cleared the landscape. And just for hours and hours, we drove this bus through this dead, sort of almost desert area. Um, and I latterly found that that was palm oil. Uh, and that had been more recently responsible for the massive clearing of those landscapes. So those are big turning points for me. Um, finished university, finished my law degree, and um, my partner, Luke, and I, we ended up in, um, in Singapore. Um, and we met an incredible legal professor, a guy named Daniel Fitzpatrick, and I ended up doing some work with him Uh he was part of the legal team and I did research and support with him. Um, he'd been working on this place called Aceh in Sumatra, um, which had just experienced the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2006. Um, and so sort of straight out of university, we ended up working with him on that. And he, um, after that time in Singapore, got both Luke, my partner, and I jobs in Aceh. Um, so that was almost 20 years ago now, and um, that was the start of the journey. <laughs> How cool. So, all right. And for context, though, you're still there. Like, why? What about the island called to you and sent you on the trajectory that, are, that you're currently doing now? So why is the island so special to you? Yeah, so 20 years ago, we ended up in this this place called Aceh that's just had this this huge tsunami. Um, and it's also one of the most important ecosystems on the planet. So three and a half million hectares of forest, uh, still orangutans, tigers, rhinos, uh, elephants. And we fell in love with this place um, and have had this long-term commitment to working there. So all of our work now is on an island called Similu, off the coast of Sumatra. Um, if you can imagine the island of Sumatra, uh, over the last 30 years, there's been extensive conversion of forest. It's been one of the highest deforestation rates in the world. Um, but the area that we uh, are working, there has been a long-term conflict there, and um, it actually left the forests intact. So... We've got this real opportunity uh, in a very special part of the world where sea turtles nest every night of the year um, and where the forests are still intact. The island that we're on still has 80% forest cover. Um, and, yeah, we are there working with two different organisations to um, protect and consider the, the islands um, for the future. And so I would love if you could maybe give us some more context. So I'm sure that I know me and I'm sure a lot of people listening, you brought them up like, you know, the Sumatran wildlife, you know, Sumatran uh, like orangutans and rhinos and uh, tigers and all this incredible wildlife. But maybe we might not know 
what exactly is happening. And you gave us a couple hints, but could you maybe teach us a little bit more? What is going on with the island? Why are you know you working so hard to conserve it? What are the conservation issues? You know, what's the driver of them? And then at the same time, like what what are what are they? And yeah, and then we can go into solutions later. But first, teach us what is going on to this beautiful place. Yeah, thanks for the the macro, the big threat we are is that we will see conversion of the landscape to an industrial land use, most likely palm oil. Uh, and that would have downstream effects. You'll see conversion of forest areas, so you'll um, have impacts to the wildlife and you'll have huge impacts to the river systems. Um, these communities are really dependent on rivers for all of their water needs um, and um, those livelihoods, the community livelihoods are dependent on those forest resources as well. So if you can imagine the islands, um, you were, we would just see conversion probably of 50% of the island to palm oil. 50? Uh, most likely. Um, so one of, the, one of the main livelihoods on the island is coconuts. Coconuts on the island uh, are aging. So they're in their senile years and they need replanting. Um, it's an existing land use that's very important to people there. Um, mostly subsistence, so they're fishers, um, they'll have their rice fields, they'll have coconut farms, and then they'll have some agroforestry, like the, you can imagine the Indonesian spices, nutmegs and cloves. Um, so their livelihoods are, are sustainable and um, they rely highly on natural resources. But what uh, one of the main challenges that the coconut sector in particular faces is that the trees are aging and that farmers don't have the ability to replant. Um, and if they don't do that, likely that some other land use will come in and um, it's likely to be palm oil companies because they have the resources to invest. Um, the other issues that we're facing from a conservation perspective is that there's a lot of poaching of wildlife and sea turtles in particular so there's a number of um, critically endangered and endangered sea turtles, um, the big leatherback turtle. And what's really happening is that, that fishers um, are going out, they're fishing, and then they're just grabbing turtle eggs to support their income. And so, yeah, we are focusing on the issue of um, conversion of these large forest areas, farmers, and particularly in the coconut sector, just because on the eating trees, uh, and then the wildlife where there are particular threats. So um, sea turtles and songbirds um, are also facing significant threats in the area uh, where we're working. So then is it, so it sounds to me, and having been in this field in a while and, and traveling quite a lot, it sounds like maybe there isn't that much opportunity outside of uh, consumptive industries, does it sound like, for a local community? And um, does that also mean, is there a growing population? Like, is there a growing population of young people and there isn't much opportunity and that's what's driving poaching? Or I guess from the, the social part of this, what is driving this from what you've, you've seen? Yeah. Well, what's driving poaching? I think that in many cases, people just think the resource is going to be a saver. So if we think about turtle eggs, um, every single turtle egg from every single nest has been poached for the past decades. Um, and they've always been there. So I don't think there's this understanding that one day they won't be. Um, so there's a, a knowledge and understanding and also needs. Um, the turtle eggs are consumed, so they're a protein source. Um, the easy to take when someone's out on an island and you're fishing. Um, so for um, additional income without any extra effort, it's just I, I'd probably do the same thing if I was a, a fisher person and my right. family needed, needed um, feeding. There's not big networks uh, involved in it. There's nothing undercover. It's just we grab them. Uh, and so, you know, I remember watching a um, video of David Attenborough eating sea turtles 
Um, there's some footage of him from like 20 or 30 years ago. So I think sometimes these conservation issues, we can blow up as this big serious thing, but for people involved in those activities, it's just an everyday thing. And it's just, it's, we talk about education and knowledge and things like that, and they can often seem like quite grandiose things, but um, it's just people are going about their everyday activities and just don't know that it's an issue. Um, so it's often just about having presence and that landscape and building relationships and being there and kind of, ch yeah, changing that knowledge over time. Um, but the other issue is the poaching of songbirds. So this is a significant, um, what is the thick, the songbird crisis. crisis. So there's like an Asian songbird working group and a lot of people focusing on songbirds in Southeast Asia. Um, and poaching of songbirds is much more serious. There's um, a serious songbird trade in this part of the world and um, people will be paid to go out and collect birds and then sell them into um, markets in Indonesia and throughout the region. Oh, so people are wanting them more as pets. Is that the main driver? Yeah, there's a saying in Indonesia that's like, you're only a real man if you've got like your knife and your bird. And so it's quite a status symbol and you've got your bird in your cage that um, sings. So we are actually focusing on a, a one um, subspecies of birds that is uh, extinct in the world. Uh, sorry, one species of bird that is extinct in the wild. And um, it's one that maybe has only a number of uh, individuals left. So it's a real crisis and we're working with a number of groups internationally on that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I'm seeing, so help me piece this all together. So it sounds like there is a, a definitely a dynamic of things going on. One, you have this incredible ecosystem that is amazing and provides a lot of things, like a lot of things that we need. It, it can support coconuts. It can support biodiversity. Um, it can support uh, spices, all the stuff that we love, and includes underground markets as well. You know, the 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 poaching, the uh, illegal pet trade industry, all those kinds of things. And maybe a lack of opportunity in other ways, shapes, or form that might be more of a sustainable livelihood. So then let's get more to the solution side. But maybe, I guess, when did you realize and notice these problems? And how did you decide to become a solution to what you were seeing around you in this beautiful space? Yeah, um, that was a process of learning. And, uh, you know, we had this incredible opportunity. When I say we, my partner Luke and I have been doing this together. Um, so we we landed as these youths, really, in Aceh after the tsunami. And there was a $7 billion aid effort of all of these international organizations around the world. And so we got a very good feel for the donor funded sector, um, the NGO world, and had the opportunity to really learn and to go deep. I worked for an organization called Fauna and Flora International and did a lot of work on um, indigenous people's rights, supporting communities to uh, access forest resources, to get rights to their forests and natural resources and learn so much um, by yeah, living and working in communities in these parts of the world. And that expanded into working more internationally on conservation projects and also into the world of carbon markets and where sort of business met conservation. One thing that we experienced by working in the donor world uh, and really what I see looking back in RJ and something that I'm really challenged by was the short-term donor funding cycles and these big projects that had a limited time span and then the work really just did not continue. Uh, and that really was the case for a lot of work in Aceh. Yes, there was some incredible work done, but for the conservation work in particular, it could only go so far. And... The opportunity to work uh, in the early days of some of the carbon projects when there was investments coming into conservation organizations, it really opened my eyes uh, and 
showed to me the opportunities around business and conservation working together. Um, so I worked for some time with Fauna and Flora International and Macquarie Bank, who had raised investment capital to develop uh, develop number of commercially financed projects around the world that were focused on conservation. And we had flexible funding. For the first time, we, if something didn't make sense, we just had a meeting about it and we redirected that finance. Um, if we needed some additional funding and it was justifiable, that was a simple conversation. Um, and that doesn't really happen in the donor community. And it's common sense if you're involved in business, but um, in the donor world, yeah, the, the restrictions on funding and requesting money and then having to spend it on this, sometimes, um, yeah, it's very limiting and actually can have um, negative impacts. So there was a need to blend this in some way and to take you know, the good aspects um, and all of the incredible impactful work that conservation organizations uh, and other NGOs do, but how to work this alongside you know, having an economic engine, um, really needing to scale, being part of an economy, uh, employing people. And so, yeah, those were challenges as well as opportunities um, that, that we experienced and learned from and took to the work that we're doing now. So is this when Ecosystem Impact was born? Yeah, we actually founded two organizations alongside of each other. Um, so Ecosystem Impact is a foundation that was set up to really focus on the sort of work that a more traditional conservation organization might do. We also established a company at the same time and they sit alongside each other. Uh, they share a vision and a mission, but they do uh, different things. They play different roles um, in that area. Uh, so the, the company is called Alawan company works with smallholder farmers uh, in the coconut sector and we've actually built uh, a processing facility or a factory out on the island of Similu where we work. So yeah, one, one island actually, one landscape uh, and these two organization were found, organizations were founded uh, at the same time and work alongside each other. That's definitely go way deeper into this because I love this concept and I hope that it happens more and more and becomes more of a thing like my current organization. Um, we started a foundation a couple years ago and its main uh, one of its main funders, I guess you can say, is the for profit side. It's so every single person that goes on one of our safaris around the world, a portion of the trip, it goes to the foundation and then people can also donate to it as well. And then when I worked for a, another uh, conservation travel company, they were the exclusive travel partners of the World Wildlife Fund, WWF. And a big chunk of the revenue that they made every single year went directly to WWF and the travelers also donated to them. So I've seen firsthand the amazingness that can happen when you partner a for-profit and a non-profit. And because I, I was previously only in the non-profit world and I think we're kind of not brainwashed, but kind of, to think that the only way to do impact is if you're doing nonprofit work and that if you're working for a for-profit, then they are just capitalist assholes, which is not true. When you have a good business model, you can actually fund conservation and then you don't have to worry about these crazy funding cycles and asking donors all the time and, and blah, 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 blah. So... That is another reason why I wanted to talk to you deep about this because it's a growing thing and you have a perfect example of how you can put the two together and they both reach the same mission of conserving this beautiful landscape. So let's dive into this more. So maybe let, let's talk about the conservation side uh, a little bit more. So what all does ecosystem impact do from, like you said, like the normal uh, classic conservation side? Like, if, tell me about your ranger program. Um, like, how do you involve local communities, the, the wildlife, like all those kinds of things? Let, let's start there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we are mostly the local community. Um, we have, I think, 65 employees now and, and 60 of those are from the islands. Um, That's a lot. Then, and then the, the other staff are mostly from other places in Indonesia. Um, so we are based on the island. We're registered on the island and our staff are from the island. And that's really important for us. 
most of the staff are community rangers and those are um, women and men from the local community who are trained to protect critically endangered animals from extinction. And in our landscape, that is the sea turtles and songbirds. It's mostly been focused on uh, sea turtles to date. And so the um, incredible community rangers are living full time in these remote islands and are patrolling the beaches and collecting data morning and night. And yeah, protecting these sea turtle eggs on, on Bankaru Island, for example, there's this piece of beach where sea turtles nest every single night of the year. And it's only because of these rangers that hatchlings are making their way to the ocean every morning of the year. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any. And before we were involved around about six years ago, the inconsistent funding to the program meant that there were sometimes rangers uh, on the island and sometimes not. And whenever they weren't there, everybody would just come pillage. But since we have been there, there have been um, patrols morning and night, 365 days a year. So it's really just about being a consistent presence. Um, and that's really important to, to work with the community at the end of the day. It's, it's, it's their resource, that the custodians, and it's important that they're, they're benefiting from any of the actual conservation work or funding that's coming into that area. Let's go back to... Um... The, or the ranger program and, and the local community that you have involved, it sounds like you, you mentioned too that you also are working with women in the area. So how has that gone? How have you been able to involve uh, women in this awesome project that you're doing? Yeah, so um, to date, most of our rangers, uh, the community rangers have been men. And Ecosystem Impact, the foundation, um, have, it's been interesting, but the rangers, and even if you think of that word ranger, what comes up in your mind often is, is a man patrolling. Um, and that really is the case where we are. And I think out of sort of 40 rangers, 39 of them are men, and we've only just started employing women. Um, so it's a real focus of, of us, of our work now. In the islands that we work, um, uh, it's Indonesia's only province where there's Sharia law. And there's often a perception that um, it's not appropriate work for women to be involved in this. But it's interesting if you delve a little deeper and you speak with women directly that there's actually a lot of um, passion and interest to be involved. So it's very important for us that we're involving women in the label management uh, and that women are involved in making the decisions in the organization. So a lot of my work um, is focused on building a team and ensuring that that team is inclusive. And that really means that women are involved in decision-making um, roles in the organization because without that, very, very different decisions are made and it flows down to the structure of our teams. Um, and so that's actually been a real challenge. It's been a challenge for me personally because I've been um, bringing up two children at the same time, and so I've not been able to play a day-to-day -day operational role that I might otherwise be able to play. So I've really had to focus on where I place my attention. Um, and over time, I've realised that that is really building the team um, and having the right woman involved that would represent the voice that perhaps on a day-to-day -day basis I'm not able to bring. So let's let's switch now to um, Alawan. I would love to learn more about, because it seems like this is, from what I understand, this is really your bread and butter. This is like what you work on a lot. So tell me about that. Maybe how did the idea for, you, you've given me a little seeds, but maybe put it all together. How did Alawan come together and, and how does the organization work? Like what is the, what is the day to day? Like how do you meet your farmers? Um, what's the big goal? Yeah. Just, just tell me everything, everything Alawan. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, in some ways, the ecosystem impact, the foundation, it's an amazing organization. Um, and very impactful, but it's also 
like many other conservation organizations, it's raising money in its pre present state from donors and is implementing quite traditional conservation work. There are other organizations that are similar. Alawan is extremely challenging. We are implementing a company, a business. We are raising international investment finance and we're investing it into a remote island landscape uh, in Indonesia off the coast of Sumatra. Low, 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 low down on the investments, uh, the, the recommended uh, investment list globally, uh, and certainly low down on the IMS um, investment index. And we're doing this because we are adding value at origin and the landscape that we work because it is core to our conservation mission. So if we think about what that macro threat is from a conservation perspective in the landscape, it is conversion of these coconut farms to palm oil and then um, further conversion into forest areas. So if palm oil companies really get a hold, um, we will see conversion of, say, 5,000 hectares of um, coconut plantations and then uh, into the forest areas. So macro conservation threats, palm oil, yes, as a conservation organisation, we could protest, we could lobby, uh, and that's important work, but really what Alawan is doing is investing in the landscape, investing in coconut farmers and producing at origin so that our business has a positive economic impact and a positive environmental impact. Uh, and that's really key. That's where we're going to drive the transformative shifts. Uh, and then, I mean, without the, without the forest, without these resources, it's almost like it's a waste of time. To, because there won't be any um, ecosystem for those songbirds um, to exist. So it's very important that they work together. Yes, the idea is that over time, Alawan will be able to provide a sustainable finance stream, a little bit like we talk about with your tourism work. But it, the, the unique thing to understand is that Alawan is doing conservation work and it's driving that shift in the, the landscape from an economic perspective. And that is why business is really important and business aligned with conservation is where we're going to see these shifts. Uh, and so that's the model that we are working on. It is not easy doing business uh, in this part of the world. Um, we've never built a business before. <laughs> um, and we're doing it in one of the challenge, most challenging places on the planet. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, kudos to you. Just like, wow. Just the fact that you've taken this massive undertaking on. It's, <laughs> well, very few people, I'm sure, like, I'm sure very few people would have the courage or just the gumption to do what you're doing. So maybe you tell me a little bit more. What is it exactly that you're doing? Are you like buying? Um, coconut oil from farmers and then producing it and then uh, selling it to a market or uh, replanting? Is it all of the above? So what is it exactly that you do? Yeah, so we work with 500 farmers. They're smallholder farmers, which means that they have between one and three hectares uh, of coconut farms. Uh, we've supported the farmers with organic certification and the farmers work with collectors and bringing fresh fallen coconuts to our production facility. Our production facility employs 70 people and they process those coconuts uh, from fresh from the brown coconut, the fibers left in the field, uh, and they are opening it, shredding it, squeezing it, and then we use a centrifugal machine. Our coconut is very high quality and it's raw, um, so we keep the nutrients in. And then, um, yeah, so it's spun in the centrifuge machine and um, has a final stage filtration process. So that is all happening out on the island. We have built a uh, field facility and we sell direct to buyers around the world. So Lush Cosmetics is one of our foundational buyers and they've been an absolutely incredible partner. And at the moment, we're setting up a number of distributors uh, globally to support the, the sales and distribution side of what we're doing. 
We have been at a relatively small scale and not at a break even point, but we've just scaled up our production. And so we're expanding those sales networks at the moment. Oh, cool. So is this a product that any us abroad, I mean, I'm in the United States. I know there's a lot of people in Australia that listen. There's people in the UK. There's everywhere around the world. People are listening right now. When, when and how can we also maybe directly support you by buying coconut oil through Alawan? Yeah, so most of our oil is sold B2B, so cosmetics, personal care, and food producers. Uh, and we're really finding that we've got a niche uh, in the cosmetics uh, market. So if anybody here is listening, uh, yeah. and I'd like to direct source for the uh, cosmetics products or they know anyone that might be interested, that's always a real value for us. We have our heads down doing the work in the area. Uh, and so anyone that's got service connections is a, is a huge support. I would love to have a broader reach and have perhaps an other one brand down the track. But at the moment, as we scale up, our energy is really focused on the farmers, on the work on the island. Uh, and so selling in bulk is a better way for us to go so that we can focus our energies on building the, the business on the ground. Um, yeah, that said... We can supply anything from sort of 20 litres to 200 litres. We love working direct with companies and we are always happy for people to share our story and to be sort of involved in understanding exactly what we're, we're doing and being part of the, the story as we grow. Um, and I'm always happy to connect directly with people. Um, so, yeah, over the, the coming months, we'll be setting up distribution in the US, uh, in Canada and throughout Europe. So those sorts of opportunities are just around the corner. Oh, that's huge. I'm sure that's so much work for you. <laughs> just thinking about your day to day. <laughs> like setting up distribution around the world. I don't even know what that, that takes or like <laughs> how you even do that. <laughs> I, I didn't be there until 12 months ago. <laughs> Well, good for you to figure it out. Amazing. So um, I also love to support brands that are supporting conservation work. And you just mentioned Lush. Are there any other brands that are pretty big that we could possibly get our hands on so that we can support you uh, directly, indirectly, if that makes sense? <laughs> Lush are uh, hands down incredible and they stand out above all others. Um, we export to them in the UK. But yeah, they've really supported us in the early days. They provide upfront finance, which means that we can produce their order, buy the coconuts from the farmers. They've also gone over and above and they're working on um, a project with us on long-tail macaques. So um, oh, really? the long, long-tail macaques are actually have endangered status um, recently. And it's very interesting, but the, <laughs> the, the monkeys are a threat um, to farmers because the monkeys steal coconuts. And so farmers will often come to us and ask for support to kill the coconuts, which is, sorry, to kill the coconuts. Farmers will come and ask for support to kill the monkeys, which is the last thing that we want to do. Um, so we're working with Lush and our long-tailed macaque working group to figure out the best way for us to conserve the monkeys, protect the monkeys, while also ensuring that the farmers have their coconuts because that's important for the farmers. Um, and that might mean that we lease um, or set aside some some land um, so that the, co the monkeys have their habitat or we do a specific planting so that um, they're not taking the coconuts but there's more attractive food. So we're just doing research at the moment. Um, yeah, so lush are buying from us and that is definitely the most impactful thing that they can do. I've talked about the impact that the company has and the importance of us being able to purchase from farmers, produce in that landscape and avoid palm oil coming in. But, yeah, they do additional support um, on conservation as well. Um, and they also supported some initial pilots with us to replant coconuts with these smallholder farmers. Uh, and that's a big part of our focus as well. That's incredible. Wow, go Lush. You know, I knew that they were like a good brand, but like, wow, like that is incredible. Now they're even becoming involved in protecting an endangered species. Like that's really cool. Also, again, another business that's doing good work. Like there's so many of them that exist nowadays. And yeah, there are a lot of companies that 
you know, are doing greenwashing and those kinds of things. But there are a lot of companies that really are doing good. And that is a perfect example. <laughs> yeah, it's transformative to everything. Yeah, yeah. So let's focus on let's let's switch gears a little bit. And I would like to focus on you. It sounds like you are juggling quite a lot between the the foundation, you know, ecosystem impact, Alawan. And how do you balance that? And also being, I'm sure what's very important to you, a, a mother, that's a big question in our field. And it's one that I've like mauled over my head too. And I ask every single person that comes on, how do you be a parent and also work on these very strong passions that you have and bring them forward? Both. <laughs> yeah. I don't actually have a simple answer to that. And every day is different. Um, Life's definitely changed since being a mother and being a mom comes first to me. So how it has looked for me is that I have had time to have stepped out. Um, I managed to pull myself out of the essential day-to-day -day operations at times. Um, and we actually homeschool our children. So most mornings I'm with them. Um, that hasn't always been the case. In the early years, I was really focused on the business. I was away um, from them a lot. And I really saw that that was starting to impact our family and our children. So um, around about three years ago, I managed to transition out of the operations. And that was very challenging. So much of who I thought I was <laughs> um, and my value in the world was tied to the work that I did. Um, and looking back now, that seems ridiculous, but it was really genuinely a struggle at the time. There's something in me that needed to let go of the work and really, really focus on my children. The children were always my priority, but I wasn't dedicating the time and the relaxed energy and just really holding space for being a mother and what they needed. Um, and the family was at times a bit chaotic. Um, and there wasn't really the, the peace on a day-to-day -day basis that was important for me. So I made the decision to, to step out, to focus on them. And it's really calmed the family. Homeschooling is the most incredible thing. And I would have never, ever, ever thought that was something that I would do. And interestingly, kind of 18 months later, as things have settled, space has opened up. And I'm able to come back and be involved in a, a different way in the company to come in perhaps from more of a bird's eye perspective. And I just would really recommend that to anybody. Yeah, it's been a real learning experience. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I'm also a very passion workaholic, really. And so to hear to hear that, I, I I know how you say it's it's ridiculous that you had to make that decision, but I can completely empathize. I if I was in your shoes, I don't even know how I would have handled that too. Like being g giving up this work that I'm sure you felt was one of the main callings in your life. So to give that up to become a mother or like to you already were a mother, but you know what I mean to to give more of your focus to your children, which again. I, I get it. I get it. it. You're just, it just, I don't know, because I, as I'm looking at my future life, I've had a lot of life shakeups, we'll call them in recent months. And I'm like, what do I even want in the future? And to hear something like that, it's like, okay, do I actually want children one day? And how will I fit that in? Which I know, again, just like you said, that's not the way to look at that, but that's a real question of mine. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I can't really even believe I'm sad. Like, I mean, even that we're having this conversation right. Right, is strange, but it's true. And this whole, the way that our world has built up, what it, what it means to be of value in this world is that as women, we're participating in meaningful work outside of the home. And the, as I said, like, I'm almost embarrassed to say that how hard it was to like pull myself out from the business, from the foundation, from work and be a mom. Well, if I look back now, I, like I, I can't even believe that that would have been something that was difficult because of this incredible experience that I've had from being an almost full-time mom and 
from homeschooling the children and just being with them day in and day out. And I have loved it. I have adored just like sitting with them and doing their learning and being with them and not having distractions uh, and just being able to go with the flow of the day, being relaxed in my nervous system. I think this is really what it is. Being relaxed in my nervous system allows them to be relaxed in their nervous system, allows our family to be relaxed in the nervous system of the family and then the work that we can do in the world can be relaxed as well. And I think that the whole world, our nervous systems are just like totally hyper. And I really, really think that the transformation, the work that we do for our planet is to connect in with the energy of our planet, that relaxed, grounded, nurturing energy of our Earth Mother, who really is our mother. She holds us, and if we can tap into her energy field, which is not this like uptight nervous system, but one that does hold itself in the energy of the Earth and is relaxed. I, I don't know. It's it's been transformative in so many ways, and just to have a relaxed nervous system and to bring that to your family is it's changed everything. <sighs> I feel like I need to just come live with you for a while and like learn how to get, learn how to get this energy. It, it, um, I mean, I didn't even expect to go down this path, but that is something that I've been struggling with a lot. And and just like I mentioned before, too, you know, having some really big life shakeups in my personal life and having to work through those and still keeping these other things that I love so much going. And then you're like, where's what's enough? That's honestly a question that I haven't been able to answer. What's enough? Like I have this show, you know, I, um, I have my full-time job, which is going great. Like I'm starting to lead trips around the world and yet it still doesn't feel like enough. And, you know, I just, to be completely transparent, I went through a divorce recently from, from something that was very not good. Like it was, it was a very traumatic experience and it wasn't a normal reason that I think a lot of people talk about, which we don't have to get into all of that, but I really haven't even let myself heal. And I've almost been diving so much into this work to, almost as like a cover up, I guess, or like a way to like, if I focus all of my attention on the work and the stuff that I'm passionate about, then everything else will maybe hopefully figure itself out. And so I've been trying to work through that myself. And so to hear you it, it sounds like the circumstance that you went through was a little different, but maybe the feelings were very similar and you had to choose, you know, putting the work, not necessarily aside, but changing your role with the work to become the family member and the happiness that you were actually looking for. I, wow. This is deep, <laughs> this is like deep chain right now. <laughs> uh, I don't have an answer, but I mean, yeah, life was really falling apart and, I actually think that's part of our process. This old part of ourselves needs to break down for this new to emerge. And that's, that's messy. Um, and we started a foundation and a company at the same time as having children. And we live on this remote island. And it wasn't easy. We've broken and broken and broken and broken over and over again. And so I, I don't want people to have this image that like, you know, you're running a company and there's this like facade of what it's like. Like it is hard. I've talked about having a calm nervous system and yes, I've invested in that by doing nothing, but like, it's like dying and coming back again. And I'm not a perfect person. And you know, I, I scream at my children and I get angry and there's challenges on a daily basis, but it has investing in more of that, uh, which really has made the difference. And for me, it was being a mum and prioritising that time with the children, which you don't do and which as women these days, you are, I mean, we've, it's overdone that women are expected to do everything, da 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 But I, I don't know if women are spending enough time with their children. And sometimes it's fine. For my family, it wasn't. And I saw it in my children that there were starting to be challenges. And, you know... I really think that my child, my child, my son in particular, was perhaps going down the like 
ADHD medication pass. And that without bringing him back into the home and into my arms, it would have been a very different trajectory. Of course, I don't know. But it was like it was just, you know, being the mum, bringing, bringing the children back close to me and just resting in that for as long as was needed for us to come. And it's really starting to happen that now everybody's like going out into the world again and people are settled and there's this really strong, rested foundation. And men can play that role, women can play that role, but there is that nurturing, mothering role that um, I think many of us have lost as women. And I didn't realise that I, I didn't have that or wasn't in touch with that. And how rewarding and beautiful that that could be and that that is. Um, and I, I'm starting to step back into the work a bit more now. And um, I absolutely, I love it. I adore it. And there's this aspect of myself that's like passionate and on fire and so excited and goes off on it. But I also do really miss those soft days at home. And I would give everything up to, to be children and prioritise those, them if they need it and if things were on balance becoming unsettled again. And that's, that's a constant dance and it's something that we kind of keep an eye on on a, on a daily basis. Um, but it isn't an easy one and they don't have any easy answers. So, yeah, thank you for, <laughs> for sharing, like, your experience and your story. It is interesting. We want to put more in, right, but sometimes we just need to pull out and let space for whatever we need to process for our emotions and for <laughs> the healing that needs to happen in so many ways. And I, I really, I see the work that I did before I had children and before I was pushed through these challenges to really process a lot of emotions. And I see how I come to it with a different perspective now. And I'm sure I will continue to evolve and change, but I believe that the conservation work needs us to be calm for us to really be on the same level of our Mother Earth and to be able to speak her language and hear what she has to say and to, I don't know, work, walk hand in hand with her. I don't know. Yeah, I... You're you're formulating so many of my feelings recently, like... As as I've, again, watched things in my own personal life that went the way they did. And and I absolutely love this women empowerment movement that's been happening. It has been great for women to have more voice, to have more freedom to do what they want. But at the same time, I feel like there's been a cost. I think there's been a cost to families. Um, I've also seen firsthand, I think there's been a lot of cost to men in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of men have been kind of neutered. Um, they're not, they don't have the same role anymore. A lot of them don't feel like they have the same, uh, just like power or gift to the household, like to, to be the, the supplier of the family, to be the one that really, um, drives the family and like supports the family. And, and like you said, there's so many broken homes anymore. There's so many divorces. I am a divorce myself. And I just wonder how much of this has been a lot of the social things that have happened recently. Again, there's been a lot of good, but I feel like there needs to be more balance. You know, I see so much bad talk online of about men and so many things. And I'm just like, some of the most important people of my life are men, you know, like I wouldn't be where I am without them. Like, can we please stop bashing 50% of the people like I just yeah uh, I think it's part of that and then also too I also think that I personally know so many women I think that would love to be home with their kids but they don't feel like they can they've boss babed too hard and now they're like high up in these companies or you know have all these responsibilities and I really do think they just want to be home and be a mommy and I don't think they feel like they can so your story is very inspirational in that sense, you know, where like your partner is truly your partner. Like he is doing this all alongside you. And also you were able to have the space and the freedom to go home and be with your kids, which I'm sure he was very much in support of too, you know, like those are his children as well. So to hear that whole story and how it happened 
that's really inspirational. I think we need more of that out in the world. Be like, it's okay. You can do both. You can still pursue your passion and you can still be a wonderful mother. Like you can do both. You can be home and you can support your husband or your partner, whatever situation somebody has. Like you can also support them to be the support, you know, to be the the head of the household or whatever that needs to be, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I'm so grateful you brought that up because a lot of it has been brought to my attention as well. Like in my 20s, I was just so like, oh, I need to drive. I need to succeed. I need to prove myself. I need to get the titles. I need to have the degrees, like blah, blah, blah. And now I'm just like, man, I don't know anymore. <laughs> I don't know if this is what I want. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know if it's what I want because I, I don't, I don't, I, mean, I deeply know that it's not without earth needs right right no no uh, yeah but it, i mean thank you for all of that and like yes 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 um i am very lucky um and grateful for my husband luke and for their partnership that we have um it's not easy and it's been challenging to manage this dynamic because every day is different and we're managing balance mm -hmm. and I know not everybody has the work relationship also to have that flexibility, but I, I do think that there's this, there's this incredible opportunity that I've had to continue to be involved and to almost continue that mothering role in the organizations, but through somebody that really, I, I don't know, it wouldn't have, I don't think it would have happened in the way that it has if it wasn't my husband. And it's been really challenging because we have to steal time away. And I'm often like frustrated about, angry about something that I see that is happening in either the foundation or the company. And I have to steal a moment and say, yeah, la, 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 la. <laughs> but I think that it has really shaped things in a unique way. And that the way that that is playing out in the companies is incredible sorry, in the company and in the foundation. Like it's very, very unique. And it, perhaps it's happening more as it would happen in a traditional society where it's maybe, you know, the, the men's out there leaving and the woman's like yapping it. <laughs> man, it's like, I mean, that sounds terrible and it's not always like that, but it's like I have been able to maintain involvement and influence um, particularly with that woman's voice and perspective and intuition. And Luke has kept the day-to-day -day operations running on the, on the times that I've needed to be there with the family. And Luke's a really active dad too. And we'll often kind of give and take and he'll be with the kids and I'll get involved in work that needs to be done. There's no simple lines there. But when you're working and your relationship as an employee is more formal, there's often not those dynamics there, but maybe those are ways that we can reshape the way that we work. And I know that we are moving in that direction, but yeah, when you're where exactly the boss babe and you've worked your way up and, and your job requires you to be there 80 hours a week, you just, that doesn't work. There's just like, my being a parent is a full-time job. Um, so if we respect the wisdom, the yeah. intuition, the influence that women can have in the workplace. We need to we need to figure out them not actually being involved. Right. 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 It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I did um I totally skipped over this topic and I am so mad at myself for doing it because uh you uh, I, I don't know which organization, I don't know if it's through the Ecosystem Impact or which one umbrella it falls under, but you have the surf resort, Mahi Mahi Surf Resort, the sustainable surf resort. Of course, sustainable tourism is one of the biggest passions of mine. And I don't know how I skipped over that, but please, could you tell me more about that? How does this resort fit into your bigger picture, bigger mission? And also like, can we come visit you? Is that a thing? Like, please tell me more about Mahi Mahi. <laughs> yeah, so my husband's a passionate surfer. Um, and yeah, I like surfing and I did before having the kids, but I haven't really surfed much since having the children. It just ends up um, being the thing that falls along the wayside. But um, we set up a, a surf resort on the island right in front of a surf break. And it's been a great place to host guests 
um, it's a real passion of Luke, but not something that I've been as involved in. I would love over time for that to be a place where we can host biodiversity conservation trips and where people can come and learn about the work that we're doing um, with the company and with the foundation. So, Brooke, please. Well, you might be talking to the perfect person about that, actually. Um, we will talk more about that offline, everybody. Um, <laughs> that is literally what I do. And and as a, a little spoiler, I'm not quite sure, but um, one of my incredible conservation tourism operations people that I used to work with. Um, she is one of the best tour designers I've ever met in my life. We used to work really closely together. We have come together on possibly building one of Rewildology's first trips. So it might be actually happening for real. I've only been talking about it for two and a half years and it actually might start. So thank you for planting that seed. I will make sure she hears that. <laughs> so Amazing. And you know, I think um, they... It's almost like a, a mix between a retreat where there's real sustenance and nurturing and uh, something I've been doing lately is um, training up in, in breath work and um, getting involved more in, in music and those sorts of modalities. I've been doing a lot of work around medicinal plants and that's been really important for you know processing emotions, calming the nervous system and I imagine that there's a lot of opportunities to develop um, these experiences where you're having an opportunity to give back, to learn, and also to rest and reconnect to yourself. Mm. That sounds exactly what I need after everything I just shared. So <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people listening could use that too. We all have our trials and tribulations and and everybody remember that whoever you're talking to, some, they're probably going through something that you can't see. So I love everybody. And so you just gave a little bit of a hint of something that you're working on. What else in the future are you working towards? Again, like as we were talking about before we hit the record button, I'm just sitting down with you in a moment in time. It's not like your stop, your work is going to stop anytime soon. So what else are you working on? What is the bigger vision for maybe ecosystem impact and Alawan and maybe the resort? What, what are you doing? What, what's the goal? Yeah, I mean, for the foreseeable future, the focus really is on the company uh, and on the foundation, but we are still in the guts of it with Alawan. Um, we financially, being in this remote island, um, you know, we're raising investment. We're making sure that we deploy that investment um, effectively. We're still building our team. We need to raise money to be able to replant coconuts and we're setting up. Uh, a financial structure and working um, to raise investment around that. So really in the, the short to medium term, I'll want the focus, everything from the farmers to the production facility, um, improving our certifications, improving our quality, and then um, with buyers, um, that will take some time and it needs focus. Um, really the, yeah, just the building a business in the remote place, uh, it's not easy and it needs our, our time and attention. And yeah, I think things will open up once, once that settles. I don't know what the time frame is on, the, on that. I do imagine that um, as the day-to-day -day operations take less of a focus, then yeah, the, the passion for me would be bringing together more of the work that um, I do sort of at FOBI around medicinal plants, uh, some of the breath work and really integrating that that more and these different worlds coming together. So, yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds beautiful. And I will definitely be happy to support you in your journey. So um, I also love to ask this question. It's, you have so much life experience and you've said, you, you've seen and you've done so much. What is one piece of advice that you would love to share with those listening before they sign off for the day? Live from your heart. Your heart knows. Yeah, listen, Qu quiet yourself enough to be able to hear the voice of your heart. 
That's beautiful. I think I need to put that on as a poster and like wake up like or like a sticky note on my bathroom mirror, you know, when you like wake up. Like, Brooke, start your day with that advice. <laughs> that is so good. You, you do know, though. You do. You do. Yeah. You're quiet enough that that voice knows. It really does. And um, life will in some way keep, keep pointing that out to you. We, it's such a beautiful life and it's so beautiful to live on this incredible planet. I absolutely agree. So Jane, you are a phenomenal person and I am so grateful that I met you and I learned from you and that you've taught us so much of your incredible work and on the island of Sumatra and the beautiful area that you work in specifically. So how can somebody follow what you're up to? You know, we already know like everybody go buy a Lush product like right now. If you need a bar of soap or some mascara, I don't care what it is, go buy. Um, whatever you need, go get it. Um, but yeah, how can somebody follow the companies, uh, both organizations, maybe uh, you, if somebody wants to reach out, if somebody wants to go to the surf resort? Yeah, what are all the things? <laughs> yeah, so all of the normal places, Alawan is A L. U-A-N. You'll find us Alawan Coconut on Instagram, website alawan.co. Um, my name, Jane Dunlop. Find me on Instagram. Uh, you're welcome to reach out. I would love to hear from you. And then Ecosystem Impact. Um, you'll find us at Ecosystem Impact Foundation. Yeah, please be in touch. <laughs> awesome. Oh, we're going to stay in touch for sure, Jane. Awesome. Well, thanks again for sitting down with me. And I cannot wait to share your story with everybody. Thank you so much, Brooke. You're a beautiful person and I love what you're doing through this podcast. So thank you. We will talk again soon. I know it. Thank you for joining me on this wild adventure today. I hope you've been inspired by the incredible stories, insights, and knowledge shared in this episode. To learn more about what you heard, be sure to check out the show notes at rewildology.com. If you enjoyed today's conversation and want to stay connected with the Rewildology community, hit that subscribe button and rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. I read every comment left across the show's platforms and your feedback truly does mean the world to me. Also, please follow the show on your favorite social media app join the Rewildologist Facebook group, and sign up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter. In the newsletter, I share recent episodes, the latest conservation news, opportunities from across the field, and updates from past guests. If you're feeling inspired and would like to make a financial contribution to the show, head on over to Rewildology.com and donate directly to the show through PayPal, or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. Remember, rewilding isn't just a concept, it's a call to action. Whether it's supporting a local conservation project, reducing your own impact, or simply sharing the knowledge you've gained today, you have the power to make a difference. A big thank you to the guests that come onto the show and share their knowledge with all of us, and to all of you, Rewildology listeners, for making the show everything it is today. This is Brooke signing off. Remember, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>